Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another video of Haitian Vibe Podcast. And today I'm joined by Dr. Elizabeth Greater Poulter. And we're going to be talking about why she believes that Martha of Bethany was added in a redaction to the Gospel of John. And for those unfamiliar, um, Elizabeth received her PhD in early Christianity and New Testament from Duke University, and she received her Master's of Arts and Master's of Sacred Theology and New Testament from General Theological Seminary of the Episcopal Church. And she is currently an assistant professor of New Testament at Villanova University. And so today's topic centers on her peer-reviewed article, Was Martha of Bethany Added to the Fourth Gospel in the Second Century? So I'd like to begin with what is the most obvious question. What led you to the conclusion that Martha of Bethany was added to the text of the Gospel of John in the second century? That's a great question. And thank you so much, Jacob, for having me on History Valley. I know there's a lot of fantastic scholars that you had on this podcast, so I'm excited to be a part of this conversation. Um so I uh, I actually began my journey, um, this article that you're talking about, it was published in the Harvard Theological Review in 2017. It was my master's thesis, actually. Um, it was, I, I began on the journey of this line of inquiry before I even began graduate work, in fact. So I didn't actually know Greek. <laughs> I was a singer songwriter living in New York City and I had just written a song about Mary Magdalene. And I think it's actually kind of important that I preface with that because anybody can find that if they look me up, it's really easy to find Libby Schrader, the songwriter who wrote the song about Mary Magdalene. And I actually released that record and that music video before I even entered graduate school. What happened was that because I was sort of interested in Mary Magdalene, um, because I had written a record about her, uh, I checked out the Complete Idiot's Guide to Mary Magdalene, um, and uh, I found out that there was, you know, controversy around Mary Magdalene in early Christianity. And I had an idea that to me seemed completely straightforward at the time, which is, oh, I want to look at the oldest manuscript of the Gospel of John and see if anything might have been tweaked. To me, that was such a straightforward, obvious question. Um which I guess maybe somebody hadn't had that question before. Um, but what ended up happening was after reading the complete idiot's guide and saying, I want to look at the world's oldest copy of the gospel of John. I did some quick Googling and found out that the world's oldest near complete copy of the gospel of John is papyrus 66, which is held um, today at the Bodmer library outside Geneva, Switzerland, but it was discovered probably in 1956 and it was first published in 1958. Um, it was discovered in uh, near Dishna, Egypt. So it's another one of these papyri that, you know, were sitting for millennia in the sands of, or almost two millennia in the sands of Egypt, and then was brought out and was published. It doesn't get as much, uh, I guess, attention as the Nag Hammadi scriptures, but it was found actually walking distance from where those jars were found. Um, and so it was first published in 1958, and it is the world's oldest copy of the Gospel of John. There is one little fragment that some of your listeners might know about called Papyrus 52. That's a little tiny scrap of John 18, but that's just a couple of lines of text, whereas Papyrus 66 is a codex that contains portions of all 21 chapters of John's Gospel. And so it's nearly complete. I mean, some parts of it are falling apart, but... Um, I didn't know any of this at the time. All I knew is that Papyrus 66 was the oldest copy of the Gospel of John, and I wanted to look at it. So I, through a friend of my childhood parish priest, I was able to get in touch with um, a professor at General Theological Seminary in Manhattan. At the time, I lived in Brooklyn, New York, um, when I was a singer-songwriter. And I was able to meet uh, this scholar, Deirdre Good, for coffee. And um, we met at the seminary and I said, I really want to look at Papyrus 66. And she very kindly sent me a transcription that had been made by the University of Birmingham, which is one of the central text critical centers of the New Testament in the world right now. They basically look at hundreds of manuscripts of um, all the gospels and letters of Paul and all the, the biblical books. And they have their poor graduate students transcribe every single manuscript letter by letter. So people who are trained to be able to read the handwriting 
they go into this online um, XML format and they type in literally every pen stroke written by uh, the scribe. Not only what the scribe writes at first, but also the corrections. And then there's little annotations. So I was able to look at this online transcription of Papyrus 66 through the university that the University of Birmingham had provided. And I was a little disappointed because it was all in Greek. I was just a lay person. And I was like, hasn't anybody translated the world's oldest copy of the Gospel of John? Um, but this maybe was a clue that I was going to end up being a scholar because I didn't give up. I said, I know what I'll do. I'll go to an interlinear study Bible. And so what I did was I had one window open to Papyrus 66 on my little laptop and then another window open to an interlinear study Bible. This is in 2012. And um, I could compare word by word and the, the transcription had all the verse numbers. So I'm like, okay, well, this is John 11 or John 20 or John 21 in Papyrus 66. And I was able to compare it to each verse in the interlinear study Bible. So of course I started in John 20, which is the encounter between Jesus and Mary Magdalene in the garden. Papyrus 66 didn't have anything out of place there. I also looked at John 19, which is the scene at the cross where Mary Magdalene is first introduced. And again, Papyrus 66 didn't seem to have anything out of place. Um, so I was about to give up and say, well, you know, I was, I was wrong. Like, who am I? I'm just some, some musician and the scholars have it under control. You know, who was I to think that there would be something funny in this world's oldest copy, but in the complete idiot's guide of <laughs> to Mary Magdalene, it mentioned that people have always wondered whether Mary of Bethany, that is Lazarus's sister in John 11 and 12, whether she was Mary Magdalene, that from the beginnings of Christianity, that's always been a question. So I'm like, well, just to be safe, let me go and look at that chapter. And when I get to that part of Papyrus 66, it's completely lit up with five verses of changes. Literally, the scribe has changed out, has crossed out the name Mary twice. The first time it's changed to say Martha. Maria and Martha are very similar words in Greek. Maria is Mary. And Martha, it's only one letter's difference in Greek because it's an iota M-A-R-I-A -A, or new alpha wrote Yoda alpha. The Iota is like an I and it had been changed to a theta, which is like a T-H in Greek. It's one letter. So the name Maria had been changed to Martha in verse one. And then in verse three, the woman's name had been completely crossed out and changed to say, hi Adelphi, which my interlinear Bible told me meant the sisters. And I would later find out that all of the verbs in that verse had been changed from singular to plural. So a woman had literally been split in two. It, it originally said in John 11, verse three, therefore Mary sent to him saying, Lord, behold, the one you love is sick. And it's changed to say, therefore the sisters sent to him saying, and all the verbs had been changed to plural. So a woman had been split in two. And I was like, whoa hey, it looks like they're adding Martha to the story, which is something that would honestly never have occurred to me. You know, I grew up in the Episcopal church. Everybody knows Mary and Martha, you know, there's Mary and she's sitting at Jesus's feet and Martha's busy with and distracted. And so, you know, everybody knows those two sisters and who, why would we ever question a separation between those two sisters? And then in John 11, Lazarus has these two sisters. It would never have occurred to me that Martha didn't belong there. If I hadn't seen with my own eyes as a total newcomer to the discipline who had no training, I said, Martha's being added to the story in this papyrus. It just seemed so blatantly obvious that that's what was happening. So I sent it to Deirdre, the professor at General Theological Seminary. And I said, look at this. And she said, very interesting. And I said, didn't anybody do anything? Did anybody follow up on this? And I suspect that Deirdre assumed, which is what most New Testament scholars would assume, hey, look, this was published in 1958. It's 2012. Um, probably everything that needed to be done on this papyrus has been done. And that was a totally reasonable um, assumption for her to make. But the fact is that the work had not been done. So what I ended up doing is I went back to the Brooklyn Public Library and on interlibrary loan, I started ordering 
scholarly articles. Again, this is a clue that maybe I was going to switch careers and end up in academia. I started ordering lot, like journal of biblical literature, like very erudite scholarly journals on interlibrary loan. And I read the articles. And again, I couldn't read Greek, but they were written in English. And I could see that people like Gordon Fee, who is one of the most esteemed textual critics of the 20th century, in 1960 something in JBL, Journal of Biblical Literature, he wrote, that's perhaps the most interesting change in the entire papyrus, this woman being split in two. He said, the name Mary has been crossed out twice. First it's changed to Martha, then she's split in two. That's the most interesting thing out of the, by the way, papyrus 66 has something like 450 corrections made over the course of the gospel, which is kind of troubling that this is our oldest copy of the gospel of John. But the scribe has is trying to make a good copy and hence all the corrections. And of all those hundreds of corrections, Gordon Fee said, this is the most interesting. And that was the end of the scholarship on it. Nobody had followed up on it. And I, I was basically freaking out. And so I started sending it to a lot of scholars and saying, hey, look at this. They're adding Martha to the story. And um, people were busy. Scholars are busy. People already already have their next project in mind. The Their projects are not suggested to them by random people on the internet. Scholars have their own reasons for pursuing their next project. And after a while, my best friend said to me, you know, Libby, you're going to have to do this yourself. You're going to have to go get a master's degree. And I said, what? That sounds horrible. Like, I don't want to learn ancient Greek. That sounds like the most boring thing I could possibly imagine. I was a singer songwriter at the time. I lived in New York. I was like, why would I leave New York? Why would I leave a job that I love? And it basically, it just, I realized that if I didn't do it, then nobody was going to do it. So I said, okay, I get to move to General Theological Seminary, which is one of the prettiest places in all of Manhattan. And I said, I'm going to enroll in this master's program. And I, I grew up in the Episcopal Church. So I just did an MA. I didn't do an MDiv. I didn't, I, I wasn't training for the priesthood. I just did the academic side. And so Deirdre became my master's thesis supervisor. And over the course of the master's thesis, other fantastic scholars at General Seminary who alas have all departed because General is now sort of, it's sort of uh, fallen into becoming part of Virginia Theological Seminary now, which is a little bit sad. It's sort of the state of seminaries these days. But at the time, Robert Owens, a fantastic textual critic was there and also Andrew Irving, who's a real specialist in old Latin sources. And um, they were guiding me and Deirdre, I really had some top-notch scholars. And I remember Andrew said, have you looked at the Vetus Latina? And I said, what are the Vetus Latina? <laughs> and they were other of some of the oldest manuscripts of the Gospel of John um, that were copied, or sorry, I should say they were translated before St. Jerome made his big translation from uh, the Greek and the Hebrew to the Latin, which is called the Latin Vulgate, which became the sort of standard text of Western Christianity for over a millennium. Um, in, in the 380s, Pope Damasus commissioned St. Jerome to make this standard Latin translation of the Bible, but that's hundreds of years after the gospels were written. So who was translating them into Latin before then? Those are the old Latin copies. It was just sort of amateurs, amateur scholars who weren't as erudite as St. Jerome, but they knew how to translate Greek into Latin. And the reason that those copies are so important is because they are translations of second or third century Greek manuscripts. And those manuscripts are now lost to us. Papyrus 66 is the oldest Greek copy, the oldest copy of the Gospel of John that we have. Um, and it's usually dated to about the turn of the third century. And the copies of um, the translations were being made into Latin from sort of contemporaneous second or third century copies of Greek gospels. Those were all lost to us, but we still have the Latin translation. And that matters because it might say something in the Latin that is strange to us to say, oh, you know, that's not what we would expect. And sometimes the translators took liberties. That's true. And yet sometimes you'll find something in one of these old Latin copies. Sometimes it's a fourth century copy, fifth century copy that it, it was copied in the fifth century, but the translation is earlier, right? So, um, and sometimes there's something in these old Latin copies that matches 
something in a very important Greek copy. And that's what ended up happening when I looked at the old Latin copies. I think I looked at something like 25 old Latin copies and one in three of these old Latin copies had something funny happening around Martha. You can see again, the name Mary was getting changed to Martha. In this one really awkward one, you see that the name Martha isn't even there. And some later copyist, hundreds of years later, just writes the word Martha on the side of the story because <laughs> Martha's not there. And so Martha, Martha's name gets added in by a later copyist. So the old Latin manuscripts sort of substantiated this thesis. Oh, well, maybe Martha's getting added. And then I looked at hundreds of Greek copies, um, not only the oldest Greek copy, which is Papyrus 66, um, but Codex Alexandrinus. Again, you see the name Mary changed to Martha. And in the first transcription of John 11, 1, there is no Martha at all in the first verse of John 11 in Codex Alexandrinus, and Martha is added by way of correction. So it turns out that uh, I've now looked at like 280 manuscripts in Greek, Latin, Coptic, Syriac, and Ge'ez, which is Ethiopic. And these instabilities around Martha happen throughout the entire textual transmission, honestly, in any century. You see problems around the name Mary and Martha, or maybe the names Mary and Martha are switched, or maybe Mary is doing something that your Bible would say that Martha did. Or sometimes um, you see Mary, for instance, sometimes Mary serves the supper in John chapter 12, which is totally unexpected. So because I've looked at so many manuscripts, and I think it's something like one in five of the Greek manuscripts have a problem around Martha. And because you can actually reconstruct most of John 11 with just Lazarus and Mary using real readings and real manuscripts, you can have like an alternate form of text, not the whole thing, but you can get a big substantial chunk of text from the crossed out readings that has just Lazarus and Mary. To me, that suggests at the very least that there is multiple text forms of the Lazarus story circulating in antiquity. Some ancient copies, fifth century and previous, had just Lazarus and Mary. Some ancient copies had Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And when these two text forms begin to mix, that's when you get all of these textual instabilities and inconsistencies throughout the entire textual record. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> oh, I definitely think you did. Do you think that this confusion, this whole process began or could have began with Papyrus 66 or perhaps earlier? I think it would have had to be before then. Um, most people who work on Papyrus 66 um, have come to the conclusion that this scribe had access to two different exemplars. Um, so this scribe, we have one copy of the Gospel of John that survives, that's Papyrus 66, but the scribe had access to two other copies that are now lost to history. And most people agree that that's what the scribe, how the scribe operated, that the scribe copied from one of those and used the second copy to correct against. So to me, it, it would make the most sense that Papyrus 66 has one copy where Lazarus has one sister and another copy where Lazarus has two sisters. And there's a lot of very strange scribal activity happening for five solid verses in P66. And all of these strange choices that the scribe makes can be explained by the scribe comparing the two versions and kind of adjudicating between them. And when you get to John 11, verse five, that's just a list of the Bethany siblings. The scribe stops. It's actually really interesting. If you look at a picture of the papyrus, you see that the scribe ends at John 11, verse four, stops, puts another ink blot, stops, writes one letter, the first letter of John 11, verse five, stops again, stop, stop, stop. Maybe the scribe had to go to the bathroom, or <laughs> maybe this is the moment when the scribe said, you know what? I have to write a list of the Bethany siblings and I have to choose. I can't keep kind of like changing one letter here or scratching out one word there. I literally have to decide, am I going to include 
Martha in the story, or am I going to just keep it at Lazarus and Mary? And I think that it's right there in John 11, verse five, that the scribe sets aside the copy that has only Lazarus and Mary and copies the rest of the chapter of the version that has Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. But we have other evidence that there might have been a, a different text form. First of all, in um, the ancient artwork, if you look at all of the ancient sarcophagi of the Lazarus story, the vast majority of them depict Jesus, Lazarus, and one woman. That's the vast majority of the ancient artwork. It's the most standard iconography. Like if you look at fourth century sarcophagi that have the Lazarus, like nearly all of them will have one woman and Jesus and Lazarus. You also get church fathers, people like Tertullian or John Chrysostom or people who are writing in the second, third, fourth centuries who refer to this story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. And they some, they say something funny. Like Tertullian says, oh, when Mary confessed Jesus as the Christ, wait a second, Martha is the one who says that Jesus is the Christ in your Bible. But in Tertullian's version, apparently Mary confessed Jesus as the Christ. This is in his treatise against Praxius and every copy of against Praxius says that Mary confessed Jesus as the Christ. Or John Chrysostom, he says that Mary said the tomb stank. But if you look at your Bible, it says that Martha said the tomb stank. And I think that um, Tertullian might not have had Martha at all. He was very, very early. But people like John Chrysostom might have had these sort of hybridized um, texts where the text is uneven. And some copies will say Martha did it and other copies will say Mary did it because the two text forms are blending. And to me, that's a really straightforward explanation for the strange evidence that we get. The other reason that I don't think that um, Papyrus 66 is the culprit, they're just someone who's participating in the chain of transmission, is that um, Origen of Alexandria wrote a commentary on the Gospel of John in the mid third century. And he definitely has Martha in his text. So if Origen, and he was in Alexandria, which is also where probably Papyrus 66 was copied in Alexandria, Egypt. So if by mid century, Origen has Martha in his copy of the Gospel of John, though interestingly, he also says that Martha is condemned. So I don't know why, why Origen said that. That's a curious thing that he says in the commentary on John. Um, if Origen has it, then it means that probably the interpolation took place probably in the second century, um, which would be the time when Luke's gospel starts to get read alongside John's gospel. And of course, Luke has the story of the sisters, Martha and Mary. And so my theory is that someone who had read Luke's gospel, who had the sisters, Martha and Mary in Luke chapter 10, that's the one where Jesus goes to Martha's house and Mary's sitting at Jesus's feet. And Martha says, Lord, tell my sister to help me. That's in Luke's gospel. I'm saying somebody had read that story of Martha and Mary. And that person had also encountered John's gospel which is the story of just Lazarus and Mary. By the way, geographically, these two stories are in different places. Martha and Mary are in the north in Galilee or Samaria. This is in Luke chapter 10, right after Jesus sets his face toward Jerusalem and he's got, he doesn't get to Jerusalem till Luke chapter 19. So in Luke chapter 10, he's definitely still in Galilee or Samaria when he encounters Martha and Mary. So that's in the north. Whereas Lazarus and Mary are in Bethany, which is the suburb of Jerusalem, just outside Jerusalem. So I'm saying that these might be two completely different families, Martha and Mary in the North, Lazarus and Mary in the South, but some early reader who perhaps didn't like the prominence that was given to Lazarus's sister, Mary in this story. And we can talk more about that in a second. Someone said, oh, Mary's too prominent in this version of the gospel of John, but I have a solution. I've read this nice gospel of Luke and we just take this character, Martha, you just change one letter, change the Iota to a Theta. Now it's Martha that confesses Jesus is the Christ. Now it's Martha who says the tomb stinks. So if you take, they, they sort of took this character that they had read in Luke and they stuck her into John, which successfully distracts the reader away from how similar Lazarus's sister Mary is to Mary Magdalene in the Gospel of John. Rather, it distracts the reader into Luke's Gospel. People say, Martha and Mary, I love those sisters, they're my favorite. So people are totally distracted away from how similar Lazarus's sister Mary is to Mary Magdalene because now she's a different Mary. She's Martha's sister Mary now. 
different woman from a different gospel. So I'm saying it's a very clever editorial move that serves an important purpose. Um, and that was at this time, probably second century is when this would have taken place. This is when there was a lot of controversy around Mary Magdalene. And we know that from texts like the gospel of Mary, the gospel of Thomas, and then those were probably second century texts. Also the gospel of Philip and also a slightly later text, the Pista Sophia. All of these texts show conflict between Mary Magdalene and Jesus's disciples, especially Peter. And they say, you know, let Mary leave us for women are not worthy of life. Or they say, she's taking the opportunity away from us. Tell her to be quiet. Um, or why does he love her more than us? So you can see that in these apocryphal texts that are authored in the second century, there is uh, second and third centuries, there is some collective memory, not necessarily that the historical Peter had a problem with the historical Mary Magdalene, but that whoever venerated Peter had a problem with those who venerated Mary Magdalene. That's what's probably going on in the gospel of Mary. Those, those sort of groups are, it's talking about a conflict between these groups. So if at the time when the gospel of Mary was written, somebody's reading the gospel of John and they know that Mary Magdalene has a lot of people are venerating her and seeing her as a leader. And some people are reading John's gospel to think that Lazarus's sister, Mary was Mary Magdalene. We know they did. Hippolytus of Rome did so. He's a third century author. Um, probably the gospel of Mary did so because the character Mary in the gospel of Mary has aspects characterization that is both like Mary of Bethany and Mary Magdalene. Um, and also uh, the Manichaeans in the third century, they thought that, Laz that, that Mary Magdalene was Mary of Bethany. So if as far back as we can possibly get in interpretation of the gospel of John, people think that Mary of Bethany is Mary Magdalene. And maybe there's a version of John's gospel where Mary Magdalene says, or just Mary, it only ever just says Mary, but she's very similar to Mary Magdalene in John chapter 20. She says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, the one coming into the world. That makes her a central character in the gospel of John. And it gives her that sort of authority that would honestly explain texts like the gospel of Mary. Like, why did they give so much authority to Mary? Maybe because the way that the gospel of John was written, Mary was a central character. And some later editors or copyists didn't like that. They're like, we like this gospel. We like this gospel of John, but we don't like this character but it's easy to tweak. You just take that character, Martha from Luke's gospel, stick her in, problem solved. Now we can accept this gospel into the canon. Why do you think that the earliest uh, editor or whoever was responsible for this, why is it that they wanted to separate Mary and Mary Magdalene as two separate people? Well, I think, <clears throat> I mean, there's lots of Marys. <laughs> so, I mean, I would say that they were trying to, so the question is the identity of Lazarus's sister, Mary, which is um, uncertain. Even I'm saying as the gospel of John was written, the word Magdalene is not found in any manuscript of John 11 or 12. The gospel always just calls her Mary. By the way, it doesn't even call her Mary of Bethany. It just calls her Mary. Lazarus has a sister and her name is Mary. And the way that the gospel author crafts the story is that this Mary has several striking similarities to the Mary at the end of the gospel, Mary Magdalene. They're both obviously named Mary. They're both crying at a tomb. They both see somebody that they love dearly rise from the dead. Really intriguingly, Jesus says to Mary in John 11, uh, where have you laid him? asking where Lazarus is. And then of course, in John chapter 20, Mary Magdalene, when she thinks Jesus is the gardener, this is all the same gospel. It's important because it's the intention of the evangelist, John. I'm not talking about history. I'm talking about the intention of the evangelist, John. The intention is to make Lazarus's sister, Mary, extremely similar to Mary Magdalene. In John chapter 20, when Mary Magdalene thinks Jesus is the gardener, she says the exact same Greek words, where have you laid him? who at the Casa Autan, okay? Also, there is like a handkerchief, this Latin loan word sudarion is used in both, in both of the stories. 
there's a stone, there's a tomb, there's a lot of like identical words that for a close reader of the Gospel of John, they're not necessarily going to say Lazarus's sister Mary is Mary Magdalene, but it absolutely puts the question in the reader's mind, is Lazarus's sister Mary, Mary Magdalene? Probably the thing that made it the clearest is that in John chapter 12, Mary anoints Jesus in Bethany. And I want to make a really clear distinction between that anointing and the anointing in Luke's gospel, which doesn't take place anywhere near Jesus's passion. And it's, again, it's in a different location. It's not in Bethany. In John's gospel, Mary anoints Jesus and he says, and Judas gets mad at her. He's like, oh, you know, we could have sold this for the poor, right? And Jesus says, um, let her keep it for the day of my burial. So he's referencing his own tomb in John chapter 12. And there's only one woman named Mary who goes to Jesus's tomb in this gospel. And that is Mary Magdalene. So there's a lot of hints, never said explicitly. I would say that the evangelist for the sensitive reader is putting a question in the reader's head. Is Lazarus's sister Mary? Mary Magdalene. And some people absolutely did think so. As far back as interpretation is traced, some people did think so, and some people did not. Hippolytus thought that she was Mary of Bethany. Origen thought she was not Mary of Bethany. So there's always been a divide on this question as to whether Mary of Bethany is Mary Magdalene. So what I'm saying is, is that an editor, knowing that people thought that this, so the, the reason this would be problematic because then you've got, if you, let's say you say, okay, I think she is Mary Magdalene. Then this one character, Mary confesses Jesus as the Christ in John 11, verse 27. That's by the way, the thesis statement of the gospel of John, she confesses Jesus is the Christ. Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, the one coming into the world confession of Jesus is the Christ central Christological statement in this gospel. Then she anoints Jesus in John chapter 12. Then she goes, she, she goes, uh, to the, to, to the cross, right? If you say, if you say for your, the readers is, I think that this is Mary Magdalene, then it's the same character who's there at Jesus's cross in John 19. She stands by him. And then she goes alone to the empty tomb. And then she gets the first appearance of the risen Jesus. And then she gets the first apostolic commission in John 20 verse 17, which makes her a central character with a lot of authority in this gospel. But I'm saying that the evangelist probably knew that that was a controversial suggestion and the evangelist handles it by just making Lazarus's sister Mary super similar to Mary Magdalene. And maybe the sensitive reader will discern this is really Mary Magdalene who did all these things without saying it out loud. The Gospel of John just does this a lot. There's a lot of like sort of under the radar information that's done through parallelism and irony. This is one of the things that John does all the time. And I'm saying that someone who was a sensitive reader, but who didn't like the evangelist's intention said, I can fix it. These will, will split her up. So it's not one character, Mary, who does all these things. It's Martha, who's going to confess Jesus is the Christ and who's going to say the tomb stinks. And now it's Martha's sister, Mary, different Mary from Luke chapter 10, that nice lady who sits at Jesus's feet. She'll anoint Jesus. In, in chapter 12. And then we still have Mary Magdalene at the cross and the empty tomb, which is not problematic because Mark already said that. Mark is the first gospel written. Everybody had already read Mark, probably including the author of John. That's, that's more commonly understood today in biblical scholarship that whoever wrote John had probably at least heard Mark's gospel. Mark makes it very clear that Mary Magdalene is at the cross and at the empty tomb. Nothing controversial about that. So John, but guess what Mark also says? Mark says that Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ. And the woman who anoints Jesus in Bethany in Mark's gospel is anonymous. So I'm saying that John might be trying to correct the record a little bit, knowing that it will be controversial to do so. Okay, maybe it wasn't Peter who confessed Jesus as the Christ. Maybe it was Mary. And I can't tell you exactly which Mary it was because I know that people are going to get mad if I say so. I'll just call her Mary. And also, the woman who anointed Jesus, I'm going to tell you her name. It's Mary. It's the same Mary, but I, I'm not going to quite say who she is because I know that that's going to make a lot of people mad. 
I'll only say the word Magdalene in the places where Mark used the word Magdalene. That's the only safe place to identify her, but I'm going to make her super similar to the Lazarus' sister Mary so that some people will figure it out. And some people did figure it out and they were like, uh, 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 uh. I'm saying somebody exactly understood what the evangelist is trying to do and said, nope, can't do that, but that's okay. I'll just take Martha from Luke's gospel, stick her in, problem solved. When does the redacted gospel of John begin to dominate the manuscript tradition? This is a great question because John is a very fluid manuscript tradition. And when you say redacted, do you mean, I mean, there's so many places where the text changes. And again, um, probably some of your listeners know this and some do not, like the story of the woman caught in adultery. That is not in any copy of the gospel of John before the fifth century. That is in, um, I think it's John 752 to the beginning of chapter eight. Um, it's this whole story. And if you look in a good study Bible, that story will be in brackets because it's basically universally acknowledged that that story is not written by the author of John. Not only that, but sometimes that story appears at the end of the gospel of John in certain manuscripts, like at Duke, they have a manuscript where the story only appears at the end of the, of the gospel. It's not there in uh, John chapter seven and eight. And sometimes that story appears in manuscripts of the gospel of Luke and not at all in John. Like you'll have a certain gospel manuscript from like the 11th century and you're reading Luke and Hey, the story of the woman caught in adultery is in Luke's gospel. When Jesus is teaching in the temple, totally different location. And when you get to John, it's not there at all. And this is, you know, this is pretty late. This is a thousand years after the gospel is written. So the story of the woman caught in adultery is floating all over the place throughout the textual transmission. Also, there is this story of the angel at the pool in Beth Zatha in John chapter five. And there's this little verse and a half that says that the angel used to go and stir up the waters. And that's only found in later manuscripts. Again, it's not in the earliest manuscripts. And it's got a really uneven tradition, like sometimes different parts of the, the verses are there and sometimes they're not. And of course, everyone has theorized for a very long time that John chapter 21 was a later edition that it, this, the gospel used to end at the end of John chapter 20, but even papyrus 66 has John 21 in it. So I would say that the gospel of John was an endlessly evolving text and different interpolations would have taken place at different times. Um, I think that this Martha Mary one probably happened in the second century. The addition of John 21 might have been a little bit before then or a little bit after, hard to know. Um, and the story of the woman caught in adultery, um, actually my advisor, Jennifer Knust, has a whole uh, a whole book about that with Tommy Wasserman. And they conclude that the story of the woman caught in adultery, I think they think that it was inserted into the gospel in the Latin West, I think in the third century. And so, um, and, and of course the, the angel at the pool, those verses, I mean, you can just see that the text is fluctuating. It's changing what you have in front of you, your printed Bible, this static text is the product of the invention of the printing press. It's not what the evangelist wrote necessarily this. It's sort of an illusion that the text is stable and solid. And we didn't get that until we had a printing press that could print the exact same thing over and over, not copied by hand anymore. But for the first 1200, 1300 years of the gospel's transmission, it was just by hand. And so there were mistakes that could creep in. There were changes that could be made. And the closer to the beginning of the textual transmission that a change was made, the more it would permeate the entire transmission. So the earlier it is, the, you're going to see it in more and more copies. But certain later ones, like the story of the woman caught in adultery, you don't find those in the oldest copies because it hadn't been added yet. <laughs> well, thank you for joining me today, Dr. Pulser. It's my pleasure. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during the live stream. Thank you.